Okay, let's hit the daily Bible reading, friends. Here we go. Today is June the 25th. June the 25th of 2020 is a Thursday. So wherever June 25th is, as you see this, who knows, but it's Thursday here in 2020. Stay in peace, stay in prayer, stay deep in the Lord. Seek the wisdom of the Lord and discernment for these days and always, especially with social upheaval and uh, health crisis and all that. Uh, don't let your hearts be troubled because you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're in Him, and He has overcome the world. So anyway, steady on, folks. That's, that's the goal. Let's hit the daily Bible reading. Hearing from the Lord every day is always an encouragement. Let's see what's going on for June 25th. We're picking it up at 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 1, and through 9, verse 13. So here we go. Elisha had told a woman whose son had been brought back to life, Take your family and move to some other place, for the Lord has called for a famine on Israel that will last for seven years. So the woman did as the man of God instructed. She took her family and settled in the land of the Philistines for seven years. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines and she went to see the king about getting back her house and land. So in one paragraph, folks, you realize seven years have passed. So they're just throwing out quick history here. Seven years of a famine. And she went to see the king to get her house and land back. As she came in, the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. The king had just said, tell me some stories about the great things Elisha has done. And Gehazi was telling the king about the time Elijah had brought a boy back to life. At that very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. How about that? So God's timing is never an accident. And these things happen much, especially in biblical writing and in normal life. I've seen it where God lined things up and can't tell you how many times. So God is in charge of our lives. And when we're submitted to him, we recognize God's hand moving. And may we always be aware of that. There you go. So Lord, look, my Lord, the king, Gehazi exclaimed, here is the woman now, and this is her son, the very one Elisha brought back to life. Is this true? The king asked her, and she told him the story. So he directed one of his officials to see that everything she had lost was restored to her, including the value of any crops that had been harvested during her absence. Wow, that's favor. Elisha went to Damascus, the capital of Aram, where King Ben-Hadad lay sick. When someone told the king that the man of God had come, the king said to Hazael, Take a gift to the man of God, then tell him to ask the Lord, Will I recover from this illness? So Hazael loaded down 40 camels with the finest products of Damascus as a gift for Elisha. He went to him and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, has sent me to ask, Will I recover from this illness? And Elisha replied, Go and tell him, You will surely recover. But actually the Lord has shown me that he will surely die. Wow, how about that? So let's see what happens here. Elisha stared at Hazael with a fixed gaze until Hazael became uneasy. Then the man of God started weeping. What's the matter, my lord? Hazael asked him. Elisha replied, I know the terrible things you will do to the people of Israel. You will burn their fortified cities, kill their young men with the sword, and dash their little children to the ground and rip open their pregnant women. Oh my gosh! Elisha seeing the treachery of these people. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Hazael responded, "How could no how could a nobody like me ever accomplish such a great such great things?" So, it doesn't mean great as in, you know, awesome. It's like horrendous big, like these mat this this huge thing. So, what's up with that? And we will find out. Elisha answered, "The Lord has shown me that you're going to be the king of Aram." When Hazael left Elisha and went back, the king asked him, What did Elisha tell you? And Hazael replied, He told me that you will surely recover. But the next day, Hazael took a blanket, soaked it in water, and held it over the king's face until he died. <laughs> well, he murdered the king. Oh, then Hazael became the next king of Aram. So he's a tyrant. Whatever's going on there, you can tell he's, 
He, he's got a dark soul. What a mess. All right, moving on. Verse 16 of 2 Kings chapter 8. Jehoram, son of King Jehoshaphat of Judah, began to rule over Judah in the fifth year of the reign of Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. But jo Jehoram followed the example of the kings of Israel and was as wicked as King Ahab, for he married one of Ahab's daughters. So Jehoram did what was evil in the Lord's sight. But the Lord did not want to destroy Judah, for he had made a covenant with David and promised that his descendants would continue to rule, shining like a lamp forever. So God's tolerating something dark for a bigger plan. Hmm. All right, we're moving on. Something to always remember. God knows the long history of something way out front. And so it's part for believers to trust and pray. Uh, it doesn't mean we just hide out in caves and not interact with society, but how people come and go and how rulers come and go, that, that's small parts of history, even though it's in, you know it impacts everybody. God always sees the bigger picture, and I always trust that, as we should. All right, during Jehoram's reign, the Edomites revolted against Judah and crowned their own king. So Jehoram went with all his chariots to attack the town of Zer, the Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders, but he went out at night and attacked them under cover of darkness. But Jehoram's army deserted him and fled to their homes. So Edom has been independent from Judah to this day. The town of Libna also revolted about that same time. The rest of the events in Jehoram's reign and everything he did are recorded in the Book of the History of the Kings of Judah. When Jehoram died, he was buried in his ancestors, with his ancestors in the city of David. There you go. This is his, then his son Ahaziah became the next king. Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, began to rule over Judah in the twelfth year of the reign of Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king. Man, a young ruler here. And he reigned in Jerusalem one year. Hmm. His mother was Athaliah, a granddaughter of King Omri of Israel. Ahaziah followed the evil example of King Ahab's family. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as Ahab's family had done, for he was related by marriage to the family of Ahab. Ahaziah joined Joram, son of Ahab, the king of Israel, in his war against King Hazael of Aram at Ramoth Gilead. When the Arameans wounded King Joram in battle, he returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds he had received at Ramoth. Because Joram was wounded, King Ahaziah of Judah went to Jezreel to visit him. All right, moving on here, we are going to read chapter 9 up to verse 13, not the whole chapter. Uh, well, that, yeah, up to 9, verse 13. June 25th still. Here we go, 2 Kings 9. Meanwhile, Elisha... Da, 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 da. The prophet had summoned a member of the group of prophets. So there's Elijah the senior and all this group of other prophets. Get ready to travel, he told him, and take this flask of oil with you. Go to Ramoth Gilead and find Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi. Call him into a private room away from his friends and pour the oil over his head. Say to him, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you to be the king over Israel. Then open the door and run for your life. <laughs> wow. All right, let's see what happens. So the young prophet did as he was told, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived there, he found Jehu sitting around with the other army officers. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which one of us, Jehu asked. For you, commander, he replied. So Jehu left the others, went into the house. Then the young prophet poured the oil over Jehu's head and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the family of Ahab, your master. In this way I will avenge the murder of my prophets and all the Lord's servants who were killed by Jezebel. See, we're still dealing with this lineage of Ahab and Jezebel. Remember, Jezebel has that spirit of manipulation and rebellion. The entire family, verse 8, the entire family of Ahab must be wiped out. I will destroy every one of his male descendants, slave and free alike. 
anywhere in Israel. I will destroy the family of Ahab as I destroyed the families of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, and of Basha, son of Ahaji, or I'm sorry, Ahijah. <laughs> Dogs will eat Ahab's wife Jezebel at the plot of land in Jezreel. Whoa, she's coming to a horrible end, folks, and no one will bury her. God's going to let the dogs eat Jezebel. Mm. Wow. Then the young prophet opened the door and ran. So I don't get that, but let's see what happened. Jehu went back to his fellow officers, and one of them asked him, What did that madman want? Is everything all right? You know how a man like that babbles on, Jehu replied. So <laughs> I guess the young prophet felt like before Jehu Maybe he would be dangerous. Maybe he thought, well, you're going to make me overthrow the king. I'm going to kill you. So whatever, the Lord did that to get the prophet out of harm's way. Jehu's pondering it. You can tell, like, you're hiding something, they said. Ah, okay, tell us. So Jehu told them, he said to me, this is what the Lord says. I have anointed you to be king of Israel. Then they quickly spread out their cloaks on the bare steps and blew the ram's horn, shouting, Jehu is king. So the officials right away are recognizing the word of the prophet. How about that? So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, led a conspiracy against King Joram. Now Joram had been with the army at Ramoth-Gilead, defending Israel against the forces of King Hazael of Aram. But King Joram was wounded in the fighting and returned to Jezreel to recover from his wounds. So Jehu told the men with him, If you want me to be king... Don't let anyone leave town and go to Jezreel to report what we have done. Hmm. Then Jehu got into a chariot and rode to Jezreel to find King Joram, who was lying there wounded. King Ahaziah of Judah was there too, for he had gone to visit him. The watchman on the tower of Jezreel saw Jehu and his company approaching, so he shouted to Joram, I see a company of troops coming. Send out a rider to ask if they are coming in peace. King Joram ordered. So a horseman went out to meet Jehu and said, The king wants to know if you are coming in peace. Jehu replied, What do you know about peace? Fall in behind me. The watchman called out to the king. The messenger has met them, but he's not returning. Hmm. Hmm. So the king sent out a second horseman. He rode up to them and said, The king wants to know if you come in peace. Again, Jehu answered, What do you know about peace? Fall in behind me. The watchman exclaimed, The messenger has met them, but he isn't returning either. It must be Jehu, son of Nimshi, for he's driving like a madman. So they're coming fast, right? They're seeing this troop coming, and it's, mo it's just not leisurely, right? So they know something's up. Quick, get my chariot ready, King Joram commanded. The King Joram of Israel and King Ahaziah of Judah rode out in their chariots to meet Jehu. They met him at the plot of land that had belonged to Naboth of Jezreel. King Joram demanded, Do you come in peace, Jehu? Jehu replied, How can there be peace as long as the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel are all around us? So Jehu now is being called into God's plan and a righteous kind of expedition, right? This is, he's going to clean house. Let's see what happens. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 23. Then King Joram turned the horses around. So you know what? We're going to pause there. I did go a little farther. It is June 25th. They wanted me to stop at 13. So I, that's a good place to stop. Because that, that phrase, how can there be peace as long as the idolatry and the witchcraft of your mother Jezebel are all around? So tomorrow we will pick it up at 23. All right. Wow. Kings and kingdoms. Yeah, they will all pass away. All right, I won't go into that old hymn. All right, June 25th, the psalm for today is 143. A psalm of King David. A theme, a prayer in the midst of hopelessness and depression. Our prayer should fit into what we know is consistent with God's character and plans. So let's see what King David's pouring out here. Psalm 143, Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my plea. Answer me because you are faithful and righteous. Don't put your servant on trial, for no one is innocent before you. My enemy has chased me. He has knocked me to the ground and forces me to live in darkness like those in the grave. <clears throat> I'm losing all hope. 
I am paralyzed with fear. I remember the days of old. I ponder all your great works and think about what you have done. I lift my hands to you in prayer. I thirst for you as parched land thirst for rain. Selah. In many psalms, there's that word selah, which means a little interlude or a pause to meditate on that. So when you see that in your Bible or anywhere where it says that, the Lord really is calling. The, the psalmist wanted it to be a thing. I lift my hands in prayer to you and I thirst for you as parched land thirst for rain. Mm. That is a good thing to ponder. Selah. Meditate. Verse 7. Come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me, or I will die. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting you. Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. I run to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. For the glory of your name, O Lord, preserve my life. Because of your faithfulness, bring me out of this distress. In your unfailing love, silence all my enemies and destroy all my foes. For I am your servant. And there you go. That's Psalm 143. A psalm of prayer psalm in desperate times when you're feeling bummed out. That's a good one to note for that. All right. June 25th, Proverb. Today is Proverb 17, verse 26. It is wrong to punish the godly for being good or to flog leaders for being honest. Well, you know, we would hope we would never do that personally or as a society. Man, but we see strange things happening even in our day. All right, just one verse of Proverbs. It is wrong to punish the godly for being good or to flog leaders for being honest. And we may think, well, who would ever do that? It's because opinions are affected not necessarily by truth. And angst and bitterness can rise up just by messing with information. And aren't we seeing that in our day on so many fronts? May we have the ability to always step back and weigh carefully. Uh, the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers. A proverb that says, a calm answer turns away wrath. Hmm. Yeah, don't be quick to anger and slow. be very slow to speak. So, many, so much wisdom in scripture. All right, June 25th. And the New Testament reading is Acts 16. We're picking it up at verse 16 and we'll go through 40. Acts 16, 16. One day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they come to tell you how to be saved. Pause. There's a demoniac. There's somebody full of a demon, and yet the demon recognizes the truth. Now, isn't that interesting? So the demon knows who these men have got. A demon would know who we are. So even though we might be around and hear people proclaim something that might be truth, the spirit of discernment would tell us, and you'll see what happens here, but what's, what's going on with this? What's the fruit of this? But it's interesting. The demon knows that the apostles were called to be what? Servants of the Most High God, and they, we come to tell people how to be saved. Another, another five-star scripture, even from a demon-possessed girl, confirming, like, how do I get saved? People say, well, God doesn't, you know, we don't care. You know, this thing of universalism, you're going to hear me reference this? No. We come to tell people how to be saved, how to be set free. Hmm. Something to ponder. Not everybody is saved. Not everybody is set free. It's not about goodness or being bad or evil. And yeah, those things weigh into it. But salvation is a whole other level. And every, and God calls all of mankind to know him through Christ. 
All right, verse 18, this went on day after day. So they're tolerating this and they're thinking, okay, well, that's who we are. Until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. So I'm going to move on. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city's in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. That wasn't true. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon... Okay, folks, the inner dungeon and clamp their feet in the stocks. So you've seen those wooden things where they're stuck in stocks in an inner dungeon. They're deep in jail, folks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off imagine this sight everybody in the jail at midnight are hearing these two guys arrested praying and singing hymns to god and the the place is ripped up i'd be shaking in my boots wouldn't you wow watch what happens all the doors were flown open, the chains fell up. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. He's thinking, oh my gosh, I failed, what happened? But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we are all here. Pause. Even those people in jail were not going to, how about that? They weren't trying to get away. Watch what happened. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Hmm. There you go, folks. Another confirmation of conversion, of decisive conversion. I'm pausing so that many of you know this. But if people ever inquire of you, like, well, people don't need to be saved. We can believe in whatever we want. <laughs> Again, this isn't physical battles. This is spiritual stuff. And it's not hating. And it's not superiority. I don't feel superior. I just feel like we are disciples of Jesus. We know the truth. We, we love God. We love people. We want them to know this because salvation is for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. So they tell him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your house. So something influenced the whole household of the jailer. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he is an, and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. Hmm. But Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison, and we are Roman citizens. <gasps> Well, you can't do that. In Roman law, they shouldn't have done that. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more, then they left town. There you go. What a powerful story. That, my friends, is June the 25th, and we're going to stop there. That's awesome. Thank you, Lord, for miracles, signs, and wonders. All right, friends, have a great day. That's the daily Bible reading. We'll see you tomorrow for another. Okay, carry on. Keep calm and carry on, right? Peace, everyone. Bye-bye.